know you guys are all like, really decided to take a moment and savor and enjoy that incredible if you want to see something like that, again, just turn on your TV on Sunday. Uh, I, I, I have to make it like a plastic bag or something. It has to be something at stake here. Maybe, how about this? I had this idea the other day. So, um, yeah, I'm a Patriots fan, and uh, it's difficult for me to talk about the Super Bowl game that they lost to the Giants. Uh, it's like a very dark spot in my life. The whole helmet catch, like it's just, it's, you know, I don't want to tear up a little bit, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. But, um, but anyway, so I thought, here's what I'll do. You know, the Patriots play the Giants, the New York football Giants. Now, I know that's like Eastern New York, but whatever. I mean, at this point, given how the Bills season went, you guys all got to come together as a state, I think, you know, to, to support the, the, the New York football Giants. Um, so, I will, uh, if you're interested in uh, there being some sort of consequences for me for showing you all these Patriots videos next Monday, uh, send your suggestions to staff at mail.cse421.net. And whatever the best suggestion is for something I should do or something I should wear on Monday, if the Patriots <laughs> do in fact lose, um, if they win, then I'm just going to come in here and we'll spend the whole class watching watching highlights of this game. <laughs> 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 if they lose, I'm not going to want to talk about it, but, but I will, you know, I'll, I'll do something fun for you guys. So if you have a suggestion, email staff. And, uh, it has to, it can't involve nudity or, you know, profanity or other things, but, but if you have something that's kind of fun and cute and would be suitably uh, embarrassing for me, uh, go ahead and send it over. All right, so today we're going to talk, uh, on Monday we talked a little bit about the special powers that the colonel has, and how the colonel gets to use those special powers or privileges. Whoa! Let's get your books. Oh, I know. Stupid laptop. Um, uh, so today we're going to talk about multiplex. So today's the first class. A lot of operating systems class start with this kind of historical overview of operating systems, where they show you these pictures of these big machines that were you know, build entire rooms of buildings back before you were born. And I decided not to do that for this class, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to cover that. So I'll, I'll dribble it in a little itty bits and pieces. So today we will talk a little bit about history, about, you know, the love story. I think of it as a love story between uh, geeks and computers that essentially created modern society, right? Uh, if you think about it. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about preemption, just how the kernel gets control on most modern systems and what it means to switch context. So what, what do I actually have to do to transition the CPU from one, aim, one thread of execution to another thread? Okay. So uh, first, again, before I miss this, we have a couple of announcements today. So almost all of assignment zero is out. My goal is to get the rest out today. Uh, the parts that are left will be similar to the GDB scripting session, uh, but they're just going to, I mean, you've already done the first thing out there. I just want to proof that you did it, so I'm going to ask you to build another kernel and script it for me. And then I'm going to give you a, a really, really short introduction to Git, and then you're going to do a little bit of Git. Right? Git is the version control system that we're, you guys have been using throughout the semester, but we're going to sort of drift little bits of Git on you on every assignment. So this assignment will just be very, very, very preliminary stuff. Yeah? Um, is it still just a very strict section the most recent Yeah, yeah. So it's still due on Monday, right? I don't think these parts will take you guys more than half an hour. So I'd, I'd like to get it in on Monday so that we can move on. Um, OK, so the website now has lots of information about the class, including the recitations, office hours. And I am getting better about getting the slides up on the web faster. Right? So it should be out. You know, it's usually when I get around to it, but when I'm getting the process now, so it will happen more regularly. And I've actually converted a lot of the videos already, and I just need to get them up and, and do a little bit of the website happy necessary to do it. Okay. So there's been a little bit of staff turnover, you know, I'm a, I'm a tough bastard to work with. So uh, uh, what happened was that uh, we had to shuffle some people around. So uh, we lost Hyphen, who's going to be, I think, TA305 now, but we picked up uh, Anu Deepa, who's back there. Stand up, wave. I don't think I actually introduced the TAAs properly, so let me do that now. It's Anu Deepa and Fung, who's uh, running the camera. And so these guys are going to be grading your assignments, so they're good people to be nice to. They're also going to be holding office hours. Uh, Sonali, who many of you have hopefully already seen cap very capably leading recitations, 
is now going to lead all the recitations. So four recitations a week. Sonali is going to be teaching every one of them. So um, you know, and I, I expect that by Friday she's just going to be really nailing it. So um, you know, if, you, if you're going to recitations, you're going to you're going to deal with Sonali. If you turn assignments, you're going to deal with these guys. So all of you guys should know these people, and they're, they're really great. Um, and then, okay, so just a reminder: when you contact your course staff, you use prof at mail.csc421.net, that gets to me, and that comes to the right place. So I get a lot of email, and if you guys just help me out a little bit, it'll help me sort out what email. I, I want to read email from you guys, but if it ends up in my inbox, it gets ignored for weeks, potentially months, potentially, there's probably some stuff in there from 2010. Um, all right, so, and then lastly, it will be off hours today from 10 to 12. Fung's going to hold those, and then Deepa's going to hold out, Anna Deepa's going to hold out for hours tonight from 5 to 7. But, you know, go easy on her, she just joined the class a couple days ago. Uh, but she should be able to help you with some of the beginning stuff. Okay? Questions about sort of course logistics? Sorry about the website. That was totally my fault. A lot of people wrote in and said, oh, it's not working. And I was like, it's working for me. Okay. So, last announcement about the ACM student chapter. Another general industry meeting tonight at 6 p.m. All right. So, great turnout last night. They're doing a lot of cool stuff this semester. So, uh, if you're interested in kind of extracurricular computer science activities, these are the guys talk. All right, so let's go back to Monday, right? You guys remember Monday, right? A couple days ago. Seems like a long time. Um, Monday, we talked about privilege. We talked about exceptions. We talked about interrupts. Okay, so questions on this material. Do you have any questions on things we talked about Monday? Any questions? So let me just remind you of something. And, and I know I know people say this and it doesn't really matter, but I can say it just because maybe it will matter for somebody. If you have a question in this class, right, the typical psychology of someone who has a question in a large lecture class is they think, I'm stupid. I'm the only person who's confused here, right? But let me tell you something. There, there's two possible sources of confusion, right? One is you and the other is me, okay? And I am much, much more likely to be the source of your confusion. And if I'm the source of your confusion, then I'm probably confused a bunch of other people in the class too, right? And those people would be very, very happy if you raise your hand and ask the question that they are struggling with as well. So please speak up. I don't care if we get through all the material every day. I'd rather people understand the material that we do have. So if you have a question, raise your hand, ask it, and I'll do my best. All right? Keep that in mind. Okay, so let's go back. Monday review. Why? Does the operating system need special privileges? Don't shout out. Everybody think about it for a minute. <laughs> right. And, and why, but why, so I want to multiplex resources, but why do I need special privileges to do that? Because I want to put the resource Right. And then after I allocate it, what do I need to make sure? That they don't block each other. That they don't, that, that they don't, you know, that they don't violate the allocation that I've created, right? So I'm going to divide up resources, and I need to force that division. Okay, great. All right, second question. True or false? Implementing common operating system directions <coughs> requires special privileges. Again, quiet. Everybody think about it for a sec. Right here. <coughs> yeah, I think so, yes. True. Anyone want to say false? Why? Because the uh, uh, permission is only needed for one time factory. Right, so there's actually an existence. Now, now, this, this is a kind of a, a tricky question, right? I would say maybe truer or falser would be the right answer to this, right? This is falser. So exokernels, which we'll talk about later, provide a design point indicating that at least it's possible to completely separate these two operating system functions, putting the resource multiplexing as the only privileged component, <coughs> the only privileged portion, and all the abstractions are implemented in essentially unprivileged libraries. Right? Now, when those abstractions like fork, for example, need to allocate resources, they do need privilege. Right? So in order for fork to create a new address space, it does need to ask the privileged part of the, of the operating system to allocate some memory. But implementing these abstractions can usually be done other than the, the, the parts that require uh, allocating the resources. OK. Operating modes. So how does the processor provide the system with these special privileges? Okay, more, but more generally, at startup, what, what happens? What's that? 
Ring zero is ready. I'm getting closer to the answer I'm looking for. What is ring zero? Kernel mode, right? Special operating mode through a privileged kernel mode, which allows the kernel to use special instructions and also to address memory instructions. Okay. Interrupt count. What happens when an interrupt occurs? What does the CPU do? First, first. If you guys start calling on answers, not everybody gets to think about this. First set. Right here. Um, first thing to step is recall something. Um, recall the step information. So, okay, so actually there's three steps, and they don't really have to happen in this order, but one of them is recording some state about the interrupt that happened. What's the second one? I'm not going to call this one. Pick up. So, what's another thing? So, I need to record some state about what happened. What else? Goes to the interrupt handling. Jump to the interrupt handler, and what's the third important thing? Oh. Enter. Go to the instructions, so that's entering the interrupt handler. We already have that one. There's a third thing. So I heard it over here. Enter privileged mode, right? This is how the operating system. The CPU transitions into privileged mode. When something that needs the kernel, it needs the kernel to help with, it jumps into privileged mode and starts executing the kernel. Right? The kernel is what loads the interrupt. Okay. Hardware interrupts. Give me some. Ex okay. So hardware interrupts occur when blank. Let's see here. In the back, right there. You. <laughs> There's an error? Probably, but, but that's a subset of an error. But this screen is completed. What's that? This screen is completed. Or what is completed? Disk. Okay, so that's an example of one, but what, what in general? Why do I have hardware? A request for hardware resources. Well, the, the, yeah, the device says, hey, I need some attention. I need some love. No, I need, I need, I need some love. Something, something happens and I want to tell, tell everybody about it, right? So when, when, when our dog, uh, Finishes his food at night. He gets really excited, and he runs around the house, kind of you know jumping up and down, and that's kind of his way of interrupting us and telling us, "Hey, I dealt with my food. It's really cool." Because then he gets more food of a different kind, and he likes it. All right. What are three examples of hardware interrupts over here in the mumbling part of the room? Reset. Reset. Yeah. Okay. That, that might be next going down the line. Another example of a hardware interrupt. When a network packet is received, when a network packet is network received, packet is received good. Uh, when uh, I would say do, uh, DVD buffer is empty, right buffer? Sure. I have different ones, but whatever. Yeah, There's a lot of different examples of things that can happen. All right, software interrupts. Right, similar. Software interrupts occur when there is a problem, mm -hmm. an unexpected problem. Okay, you're close. You're close. Save that answer for exception. Time. Hardware interrupts. Software interrupts occur when. What's that? Signals? Not quite good with signals. Remember, there were two different, we had software interrupts and software something else. We're going to get through the stuff over there. Uh, I don't watch that. Software interrupts happen when? Program needs assistance. Yes, the program needs help. The application needs help. The application needs the kernel to do something on its behalf. Call it so examples of software interrupts. We've talked about system calls in this class, right? We've talked about four system calls. Could anyone name three of them? Back here. System calls. Examples of system calls. Four, exact, wait, exit. We've talked about four of them already. There's a bunch more. Those, are, those will cause software interrupts. That's how, when you call four, the kernel starts to run. Uh, Can you guys turn on the volume? Uh, this yeah. creed and, uh, Disk read request, disk write request, they are also in uh, software interrupt, right? No, those are hardware interrupts. <coughs> no, request from the Oh, site sorry, sorry. Request software. from the software to read, yes. So that's another portion of the, of the system call interface. Read, write, open, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, those will similarly cause software interrupts. All right. Now, come back to the person who said something about errors. Software exceptions occur when there's a 
problem. There we go. The software has caused some kind of problem or just some sort of exceptional condition, right? So examples of exception. Page fault, so that's a good example. You? Is that a <coughs> memory overflow? Yeah, okay. Depends on how it happens. Divide by zero. That's everybody's favorite. But let's see. What, one, one more. Is there one more? No pointer exception. No pointer exception. Right. So that'll actually cause a, a memory a memory fault. Segmentation. Right. Uh, right. So that, that that's what creates a segmentation. No pointer. Yeah. Uh, divide by zero. <laughs> the other one I had was an attempt to use some sort of privileges function. Right. That will also cause an exception, which the kernel will be. All right. Okay, so last couple things. We talked, we, we said that the kernel could ignore certain interrupts, particularly device interrupts, by setting a bit mask that essentially indicates that those interrupts will not cause the interrupt service to be triggered. So why would I want to do that? Why would I want to mask interrupts? explain exactly what you know two instructions do. Right? So if you read that stuff, I think it'll make more sense. But the idea is there is an exception entry point that's that's <coughs> basically part that's loaded. You can actually see where the kernel loads the exception handlers, which is kind of fun. But then the exception handlers themselves, there's an entry point, and in that entry point you assume that interrupts are off, the um, kernel is in privileged mode, and and basically you're, that's the code that's executed because that's the code that's been loaded into that interrupt slot. Yeah, over here. Uh, you mentioned page fault as uh, one of the software interrupts. Exception. Uh, exception. Right. So so actually this is a good question, right? What is the difference between a software interrupt and a software exception? In terms of from the perspective of software. Yeah. Cross code. One's the request for attention and one's the demand. This has to be done. Well, it's not even a demand. It's not even, it's not intentional, right? An exception happens when the, the kernel is entered, but the user application didn't expect it to happen, right? Like, I, the, I executed an instruction, and I just thought I was executing this instruction, and I don't realize that the kernel has actually been trapped into something has happened, and then in the case of memory address uh, translation, that, ex, that instruction is restarted, and it will complete as if nothing happened. <coughs> So, what was your question? Sorry. Um, no, I was uh, I was thinking uh, actually that so it's a software interrupt. Right, right, right. So, so it's not a software interrupt because the, the way the virtual address translation works, and I, this is really this is my favorite part of operating systems, and really the, kind of a beautiful uh, abstraction that's built 
to allow programs to execute. But the nice thing about virtual memory is that programs don't ask, have to ask to use it. Programs just use a memory address like it's a real address. And behind the scenes, the operating system is translating those addresses so that they actually map down to hardware, you know, physical memory, potentially. So that's why it's an exception. I just run the, I just run the instruction from the perspective of an application. And I don't, again, I don't realize that what happened behind the scenes was that the kernel was required to load a translation for that address. Right? So again, we'll come back to this. But that's, so if, if you had to, if every time you needed to use a memory address, you had to request help from the kernel, it would be terrible. I mean, your programs would be so slow, right? We'll talk a little bit about why today, because it turns out that context switching in and out of the kernel is not free. It's actually fairly expensive. And so we want to make sure that, if you had to do that on every memory access, again, I mean, just you forget, right? We wouldn't have virtual memory, it would never work, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there, there are these, um, I don't, I, I, yeah, basically, I, I think that that's true, and that's one of the reasons why when they start running, they, they set the interrupt mask so that no other interrupts can block them, right? So hopefully what will happen is, if I create another interrupt, I'll, I'll exit the interrupt service routine, the bit, I'll turn the interrupts back on, and then immediately I'll enter again, right? So normally, you know, inter nested interrupts get really, really weak. And you, you normally try to avoid that happening because so and, and what that means is that error handlers tend to be very very short compact pieces of code that just do a few things. Like if it's a disk, if the disk is signaled that it's ready, I might not actually read all the data. I might just tell the kernel, hey, there's some data to be read, and then the next time the kernel gets around to paying attention to the disk, so take care of itself. All right. Any other questions about this stuff? Good. Good, good questions today. All right. So. Let's talk about CPU limitations. So again, one of the points of the abstractions that the operating system creates to manage the CPU are that there are prob problems, limitations. I should have called these problems, but really, you know, limitations. So what are, what are some of the limitations of the CPU? So historically, in old machines, most machines were uniprocessor, particularly personal machines, were uniprocessor machines. Why? Has anyone ever thought about this? Why were these machines uniprocessor machines? <coughs> Anybody want to venture a guess? What's that? Oh, that, 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 oh okay, so that, that's a model of computing, but you might have been able to say, hey, my machine would go faster if I had more than one processor. Cost, right? CPUs are expensive. You know, they're, they're the most complex portion of your system. So you're not going to throw, I mean, you might if you had, you know, 10 Gs to drop 10 years ago, they would get a machine with like 16 processors in it. Right. This isn't even multi-core, this would be multi-process, like a whole set of problems, right? Uh, so yeah. Co uh, coordination between external cores is much more, uh, external processors is much more difficult than internally cores. Right, right, it is. And, and, and I'm not going to talk about that because it's more of a hardware thing, but you're right. So multi -pro dealing with multi-processors is more complicated than dealing with multi-cores because multi-processors share less state and communication between them. <laughs> but anyway, so, so now we have, met, you know, most of your machines, even laptops, even phones and tablets now are multi-core machines. If, if you take it in a hardware class, it's why, right? Why did we, you know, for so long this one core model worked fine. So why did we abandon it and not like to, to push out the multiple core? Speed limitation. <laughs> yeah. So, so more speed, but but for years I had one processor and it just got faster and faster and faster and faster. Right? Yeah, ceiling, right? So I hit a ceiling. And, and what, what happened, and again, I don't want to get into the harder details because I'll get them wrong, probably. Uh, but that at some point, our quest for density ran up against some fundamental limitations, right? One of them is power, another is, is thermal management. So you guys ever have those old, pen, anyone have a Pentium 4 system back in the day? Anybody besides me? Remember the heat sink on that thing? It was like a foot tall, right? <laughs> I'm serious. You look in your system now with these, these core duo machines, much, much smaller profile heat sink, right? So those penny of boards, I mean, you could fry eggs on them. I think people actually did that. You could probably go find videos showing people cooking things on their P4 just using the heat. <laughs> it. So, so at some point, it got smaller and smaller and smaller and denser, and then we blew up. And we decided <coughs> to, go, to go out rather than keep going small. All right, so but, but generally, multi-cores hasn't solved you know, the, the scheduling problem that we have. Why? I, you know, I, I have an eight-core machine on my desk. Fantastic machine. I love it. It never feels slow. But 
in general, there are still fewer what than what? Processes. Cores and processes, right? I've still got, you know, in, in, a, in a given day, oh, actually, I actually didn't. Okay. In a given day, I've got, you know, 18 Firefox windows open, and I'm running a couple of virtual machines, and I've got six terminals. So, so in general, there's still a lot more tasks than there are cores, even on a, a pretty deep. All right. So, the other, the other interesting CPU limitation, this isn't so much a limitation, it's just a feature of the CPU. It's important. This is actually really critical to, to what we're going to talk about today. What, so, what, what is the relationship between the CPU and other parts of the CPU? And too many answers for me. Let me do it. The CPU is, is what, what about CPU and memory, right? What's, so, so, what is the CPU typically, you know, much, much more what than other parts of the system? Fast. 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 Right? Smarter too, but whatever. It's a lot we've done. You're supposed to do one thing quickly, right? So the CPU is so fast that accessing hardware devices creates these long periods of time where if I'm not clever, my CPU, if, if, I, if every time you did a disk read, the process, the CPU, the entire machine waited for that to complete, and the CPU is sitting there for a long period of time doing that. And it turns out that, that these are addressed in different ways, right? So memory, right? So memory is, is typically, so typically, loads and stores will cause, you know, maybe, I, I don't know, I, I shouldn't quote numbers, but a small number of CPU cycle stalls, right? Maybe 20 or 50 CPU instructions go by waiting for that memory read to complete, right? This is usually something that's addressed in hardware, right? So if any of you guys have studied hardware and looked at out-of-order out execution and those kinds of systems, that's how this is done, right? By the CPU playing games internally, right? To reorder instructions and hide those latencies, right? Larger latencies, like latencies to disk, which can be incredibly long from the scale of the CPU, are handled by the operating system to scale. We're going to talk about that over the next week. But the, one of the more interesting sources of latency on the system is you, right? I mean, so I, I, I was, um, when I was looking this up, I decided to look up research that was done on human perceptual limitations. So there's a paper about 10 years ago that explores different, you know, uh, different ways of thinking about uh, perceptual limitations in terms of latency, right? What kind of latency are humans sensitive to? So according to this, there's this kind of 15 millisecond rule of thumb that they really couldn't figure out how to justify it. Okay, that, that's one number, right? Fra so frame rates for video, right? It turns out most, what I found out is most cartoons, so the, the point at which your brain will start to process moving images as, you know, Flashing images as actual motion is, I think, something like 15 frames per second. And if you ever watch Saturday morning cartoons, that's usually the speed at which those go. At least maybe the old ones. They were probably drawn by, by hand, and so there was no, you know, you just wanted to get over the bar where it would start to look like motion rather than a bunch of frames being flashed, right? But for video to look smooth, what are what are most movies filmed at? 30, right? 30 frames per second. I think it's actually like 29.97. Some idiotic people, right? There's probably some fraction that makes that make sense. So that's the point at which things start to look smooth. And then this paper pointed out that back in the days of the old telephone system, there was a real attention to keeping latencies for telephone communication below 100 milliseconds. And if any of you guys have ever used uh, some sort of in internet telephony product, or maybe you've made a phone call overseas using some sort of dodgy phone card that creates these pretty long latencies, you'll know that at some point, if there's enough of a delay in human conversation, our conversational patterns start to break down, right? So it becomes hard to talk to somebody because you say something, and then you're not sure if they're answering or not because they're still listening to you, so you know what I mean. So but let's express these delays in terms of a one gigahertz processor. How many cycles? 15 milliseconds. 15 milliseconds rule of thumb. Who can do this math quickly? How many cycles does that correspond? 15 milliseconds on a one gigahertz processor. Not, this is not hard math, but I know, they're big numbers. 15 million cycles, right? 15 million cycles? Clocks, right? Now, this is another number of instructions. A lot of instructions take more than one cycle. But anyway, the point is that that's a huge number, right? So in the time that you think nothing has happened on your computer, actually a lot can happen, right? A lot can happen. And that's how we create the illusion of the currency using a processor system. So keep this in mind when we come back later. 
All right, so let's let's do our little fun history lesson, right? So back again, you know, long ago in the land before time, dinosaurs were on the earth. Um, <laughs> I mean, I look like that some days. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get to PCs, right? That, that's that's what this whole starts to break down, right? So so the first the first computers, and, and this just in case because it blends in really nicely, doesn't? This terminal is overlaid here. That is not part of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's blending into me. I was like, oh wow, <laughs> that was actually real. Wow, we did all this work so we could draw a terminal like that. Um, so so anyway, so these guys are, are programming one of these original. Ancient computers, you know, the Harvard Mark I, and actually there's pieces of this that are still on campus. Okay, um, and back then they did on thing at a time, which we won. Um, back then, I mean, the computers were like really powerful calculators, right? I mean, they essentially they're usually given some sort of computational task that was hard to do. Like, for example, World War II. What did a lot of computers spend a lot of time doing? Ballistics, right? Trajectories for bombs and other things, right? Calculating these. These, what, what now you would do in a fraction of a second using Mathematica, but at the time, I mean, these things, you know, like, oh, wow, we'll get the answer in five days. This is fast. So it's really, I mean, it's, it's really astonishing, and I think it's something that's worth kind of meditating on a little bit, how fast computers have gotten and how cheap they've gotten. Because it really is, the, I think, the driving force of modern society that explains most of, of what we're building with technology today, right? It's just, and also the relationship between humans and computers, right? So it used to be, one of the ways that people explain this is that computers were really, really, really expensive, right? So these computers were super expensive. They were probably built by hand. They were made one at a time. You know, it took years and years to get them up and running. The humans, in comparison, were cheap, right? So ancient days of computers. Humans cheap, computer expensive, right? Now it's completely reversed, right? Computers are dirt cheap. And it's the, the one thing that's not scaling in computing what is, the one, what is the one thing that has never scaled when it comes to computing and particularly to human-computer interaction? So computers have gotten faster, they've got larger memory, they can do more at one time, they can do more faster, they can store more data. What can they not do? I.O. not kept up. No, no, no. I.O. is improved. I.O. is not kept up, but I.O. is improved, right? Yeah. Programming? Pro programming? I think programming is probably improved. Slower than I would want, right? But what's the fundamental limitation in the relationship between you and your computer now? It used to get better. Well, you just did, I think you just have gotten better. You seen uh, Disney's computer? It's <laughs> 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 better than I. So, uh, uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence. I, AI's gotten better. Have you seen Watson? Oh, go watch Watson play Jeopardy. Man. I mean, that's pretty awesome. So, oh, okay. yeah, it's something for, more fundamental. Uh, human interaction with computer. What? What particularly about it? Response. Time, response time. So the response time, but also the amount of time in your day, right? <laughs> the amount of time in your day is not scaling, right? And one of the things, that, you know, one of the things when we talk about modern computing, and there are people like me who, who actually, despite the fact that I love computers, I'm sometimes frustrated by how much time I have to spend being with them, right? And I would like that time to do other things. So my time is not scaling, right? And part of Going forward, I think in computing as a field, speaking very philosophically, is figuring out how to manage people's time better. Right? If you guys could get done the same thing you do with your computer now in half the time, you know, you'd have more time to, you know, watch the Patriots win the Super Bowl, or you know, go out for a cup of coffee with friends. So, so learning how to manage use of time is really important. Anyway, sorry, that was a little bit of a thought. Okay, so at some point, unfortunately, so. So, so this is like this is like the garden, right, for the geeks, and and I use that term with a huge amount of respect and a huge amount of love, right? I consider myself a geek, right? But I, just, I need to use that term because something kind of describe those guys, right? So this is this is the garden, right? This, the geeks had their computers, and pretty much they had their computers all to themselves, right? And at some point, people wanted to use these computers, right? And that was frustrating for the geeks because they were like, "Ah, oh, that's my computer. This is my toy. I don't want you." Imagine if your computer under your desk was the only computer in the world, 
right? Or the only computer in Buffalo. And there were all these people that were like, hey man, can I use your computer? I want to play Angry Birds. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and like, I'm doing my really important, you know, OS-161 homework. And they were like, I don't care, I want to play Angry Birds. Right? So, okay. Anyway, so, and, and essentially what, what you did in the early days of computing was that you just queued up people, right? And, and, and as, as recently as, you know, maybe the, it's not that recent anymore, but, you know, my, the, the, the woman who taught me this class, when she was programming her assignments at Harvard, she did things on punch cards. And how did punch cards work? You programmed a stack of cards, you took them somewhere, and someone said, okay, and they put them in a, you know, in a queue, and then those cards got fed into the computer, and maybe like six hours later, if you were lucky, you would get a card back and it would say air. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, air in line three. Right? <laughs> you're like, oh, okay, so then that, that's how things work, right? So people queued up to start, right? But at some point, people wanted to actually interact with the computer, right? People wanted, people wanted their own chance to get in front of the computer, right? What, what is this similar to today? Actually, our department actually still has remnants of this, right? So if any, has anyone used the Sunray workstation? Dumb terminals, then you right? So this is kind of the thin climb model. I don't know what these are. I just grabbed this picture off the internet. These look like they might be smart enough to actually be real computers. But for a while, there was just this idea of, of you had to have a terminal. And all those terminals were essentially connected to the same computer. Right? There was no computer here. There were just wires that led from every one of these terminals back to some mainframe that was sitting back there trying to keep up with everybody. And these systems were I mean, probably pretty terrible. right? You can imagine. like sitting there and, oh man, it's like there's 50 people logged on. I mean, from what I was told, there was a perceptible delay with these systems. If you were the only user, it was great, right? If there are 100 people logged on, oh boy. You better know, like, get used to, to, to long delays for your keystrokes, right? Um, so, but at this point, this creates this problem, right? Which here, I've got, you know, here I have a one program system. Here I have a one program at a time system. And now I've got to figure out, you know, how do I support, I love how these show up like a second late. It's like a little surprise party. Okay. So, so now, now what are we going to do? So it turned out that, you know, the geeks build operating systems to solve this problem, right? And, and one of the, actually we'll get to, one of the first, are you raising your hand or just holding your bottle a lot? <laughs> scheduling is that all these things that your computer does now, I mean, they, they all, it, it's like computer evolution, right? They all trace back to these early systems. A lot of them do. A lot of the concepts and a lot of the, the key ideas, right, come out of, and, and again, it's, it's tough as a computer scientist, and I think it's something that you have to make some mental effort to do to remember and think about what these early systems were like, right? And think about, because now systems are so fast that it's almost like you can't make any mistakes, right? But back when computers were really slow, you know, mistakes were pain, right? So if I've got one big computer and I only have one job, right, then all I really need to do is figure out how to schedule the humans, right? I mean, this is a human scheduling problem. So back in the day, it was like, you know, you would show up and you'd go into the room and there's a computer and it was yours to use, you know? You just had to turn off the lights and clean up things when you were done, right? So this, this is not a computer scheduling problem, this is a human scheduling problem, right? So at some point, what started to happen is that there was this group of, uh, you know, computer priests, maybe we'll call them, who decided to take over the operation of these computers. And what they did is, again, they did back processing. So you would bring a program to them to run, and they would run it for you, and at some point they would return the result, right? And in, in batch scheduling, essentially every job just runs until it finishes, right? And there's actually still systems that are built like this today, and there's still good reason sometimes to build systems like this. But you know, again, I, I ran Firefox, so Firefox is done. Again, I mean, I'm using I'm using applications that are interactive, so these aren't great examples, right? But the point is that things ran until they finished, the machine stopped, I reloaded something else, and then it ran until. Right, so this this was a very easy model. Now, now the, the question here, right? Of course, is that you know, going back to my idea of operating systems as multiplexing and providing abstractions, is there any multiplexing going on? No, so that component of operating systems really wasn't needed. Right? 
and to some degree, you know, operating systems with these kinds of machines are really just libraries of useful functionality that programs might want to use. Right? You might want to say, hey, um, you know, here, here's a library that makes programming this computer easier. I don't know who this is, but all right. All right, so what are the problems with batch scheduling, right? So simple batch scheduling, every machine, every program has complete access to the machine until it finishes executing, right? So go back to my problems or limitations with the CPU. What, what, what problem does this create? Way faster than the other components. Could be idling a lot. Could be idling a lot, right? Why? Because some of the stuff are idling. Some of the software that are running, they only require the CPU. For example, to take access memory takes 40 cycles. Not right, right, right. And as disk might take access disk, even on these slow systems, everything was slow, right? So an access disk might take thousands of cycles. And because there's no other program that's using the machine, during those thousands of cycles, nothing happens, right? You just sit there waiting for the disk to finish whatever it was. Right. So, to some degree, multi programming emerged out of a desire to hide these latencies, right? To exploit these latencies, to say, hey, as long as the CPU is not doing anything, right? I might as well use it to run some other program, right? I might as well use it temporarily to run some other program. So again, slower parts of the system are now going to bottleneck the entire system. So your program will only run as fast as the I.O. that it does, right? Whereas if I'm clever and I interleave the I.O. and the CPU access of two programs, I might be able to actually, depending on their access patterns, I could complete two programs at the time that it takes me to run each one of them separately, right? Because if one is using the disk while the other is using the CPU and I just keep handing back and forth, then they will both complete at the same time and it's a time it would have taken either one of them to run by itself. <coughs> so the solution, again, is, is to context switch the machine. Right? So this is, the context switching is the idea of stopping one program from running, saving its state, and starting another one. So you'll see here that these are not running to completion. And on old batch scheduling systems, they would run until they blocked. Right? So they would run until they did something where they didn't need the CPU anymore. Like, for example, you know, read something from this, or try to grab some input from the keyboard, or you know, use the, use the internet. Right? There's definitely an internet back then. Um, so the idea is that these, you know, these, this is one of the first, you know, this is the birth of context. Right? This is why it was done early in these batch publishes, simply to hide the latencies of these little devices. So now that I'm doing this, I'm multiplexing, right? So now I need an operator. Now, I, I might need an operating system in the form we know today because it's possible that, you know, that, that these applications can cooperate to do this. But one of the bursts of, of operating system software was simply to hide these latencies. That's important to remember. All right, so now, once I, so the, other, the next big thing, in my opinion, that happens to machines is that they become interactive. Okay? These old machines, again, despite the fact that I have interactive applications up here, which is a bug in the slide, right? These old machines are non-interactive. You show up, I mean, you, you don't interact with the machine, you interact with the person, right? The, the uh, person who's managing the machine. Right? That's who you give your punch cards to and then they hand them back, right? Maybe they smile at you if you're like, so, um, maybe they look down at your shoes. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, so now people actually want to interact with these machines. Right. And this interactivity creates the next set of problems, right? Because interactivity means that either if I have multiple users using the same machine, right, I need to I need to operate the machine so that the machine seems responsive to everybody. If I have one user using the machine, I still have a problem because they may want to run multiple things at the same time. And so now I need to create this illusion of concurrency, right? I need to create the illusion that multiple things are running at the same time. So, how do I do this? Who has an idea about how how do I implement this this uh, illusion? You assume that things fast enough so they're not perceptible. Right. So go back to those human perceptual limits. Right. People won't notice. Right. So the operating system essentially is like, you know what? People aren't going to notice if I just you know grab the CPU from Firefox for a minute to let this other thing. So if you zoom in here, this this is designed to show that. The appearance is that, and again, on, on my machine or your machine, this thing is way bigger, right? There's probably like 40 different applications running quote unquote at once, right? But what's actually happening? So I'm going to zoom in here, right? Zoom in here. 
zoom in, and then I got bored of doing the slides, so I just decided let's cut the picture. Right? So this is actually what's happening. Right? If you zoom out, this is what it looks like to you as the user. If you zoom in, this is what it looks like to the machine. Right? Run Firefox, for it. Bit of time, stop, run the turbo. Stop, run Firefox, stop. If I, if I do this fast enough, right, again, look at the time axis here. The, hu the human won't notice. The user won't. And, and both applications are the same responsive and like their operating system. Questions about that? This is, I think this is pretty big. But this will create some overhead on the Yes, yes, yes. I'm coming to that. So how, so how do I do this? Right? First problem is how does the OS get control? We talked about this last time. Right? Got hardware interrupts, software interrupts, and software exceptions. Right? These are how the operating system gets control. The question is, what if a long period of time goes by where there, the disk doesn't need any attention, there's nothing that shows up on the network card, the program doesn't make a system call, and it doesn't divide by zero. How does the operating system get control? How, but, yeah, but how do I implement it? A timer. A timer. Ah, there we go. Right. You guys know this stuff. It's good. Timer interrupts. So every modern system has a timer. And that timer generates interrupts at a fixed rate. And those interrupts are the basis for preemption. So the timer is always firing, and the timer ensures that, you know, never will, you know, one millisecond or 100 microseconds or whatever it is go by without the operating system getting a chance to run. And every time the timer interrupt fires, you know, I, it, the rest of the interrupt handling is, is unchanged, right? It just like a trap in the OS. I look around and see what needs to be done. And one of the things I might do is I might stop the current thread, save its context, and start something else. Right? But, but this is the mechanism. How this is what give, you know this is what allows me to do preemptive scheduling. I have to have this time. Right? So, so the idea here is that now I have time markers, right? And from the perspective of a thread, this creates this this issue interesting to a thread, right? To a thread, to a process, it looks like I'm just executing a stream of instructions, right? But what could actually happen at any time? At any time, I might be stopped, and another thread might run, and I might start running again. And, and from what the operating system, the goal of context switching is to make this look completely seamless, right? I don't want the thread to notice, right? When the thread starts running again, it should, it should never even know that it was stopped, right? Now, it probably can know, right? How would it, what's one way that it could find out? I always ready. It could look at the time, right? It could grab the time. So, so the, the, this is not to say that it really looks like, you know, that, that there's no way for a thread to know that it stopped. But really the idea is that when it starts running on the CPU, the CPU should essentially be exactly as it left. Right? If it's not, then weird things should happen, right? Because it's not expected that something's going to change in between two randomly constructed threads. <coughs> So what state do we need to save in order to implement this? Right? Threads running along, it's using the CPU, it's you know doing stuff with registers, it's you know writing stuff to memory. So what do I need to save? One at a time. What do I need to save? The addresses. So ad addresses, right? So there's something about memory I need to save. Okay, but what, what's more what's more fundamental to the CPU? Program counter is an example of what? A register, right? So that's what CPUs are, right? CPUs execute instructions and they change the state of registers, right? So the register state is constantly changing. And if I'm going to stop a thread and restart it, I need to make sure primarily that I save the register, right? So every register, with the exception of a couple on the next, there are a couple kernel only registers that applications are not supposed to make any assumptions about what happened to those. And I'm not even sure that the assembler will use them, right? <coughs> There, there are a couple of kernel-only registers right, that are not guaranteed to be saved across caps, but everything else is. Right? So the first thing that I do when I trap into the kernel is I save the thread state of the thread that was running. And I'm going to show you that code in a second. Right? Why, do, why do I have to do that first? Because it might get interrupted while you do it. have to go back. OK, that's one reason. I, I do want to go back. But why do I have to do it first? Hey, guess. So, so the kernel is going to start running. What does that mean? The state of the registers is going to change. Right? I'm going to start running my kernel code. Right? My kernel code is going to use the registers that the application was just using. So if I don't save them right away, if I say I'll save them in a few minutes, 
right? By the time I get around to saving them, they're my register state, not the threat. Right? So the first thing I have to do is save the register state. Yeah? Uh, how, means, how does the saving those registers, the code, run? I'll show you. All right. So, so uh, okay, I, 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 I said at the beginning of class that I wasn't going to do this that much, but, but I can't help myself because I, I, I think this is cool. And I think I'm trying, to, I'm trying to entice you guys into your own code, right? So this file is in your source tree, right? Exception mips.s. It's an assembly, everything that labeled .s is an assembly file, right? This is the common exception handling code that is jumped to by both types of exceptions on mips. You can actually go and see how this is implemented, but I've, I've just cut out a little piece, right? And again, David has done a fantastic job of explaining what's happened and what the state of the world is, right? So when I get this code, it arcs are off, Right? And I'm in privilege mode, so the, the, current, the, the processor did this for us, right? The processor has loaded some values into, or maybe, maybe we did that. Actually, I think K0 and K1 are done in the, in the very, very top of the exception handling code. So those are kernel registers that the application is not supposed to make any assumptions of. So I, I, the, this code has used those, right? Yeah, well, they're, they're not, they're, it's not allowed to make assumptions about those registers, or really even use them, right? So what does this code do? Right? Can anyone read the, co the code Save comment? Stack. Right? Allocate stack space. Right? So it allocates space on the stack. And then it starts storing instructions. So this goes on for a while. If you go look at this code, there's a block of code about that big, right? Where address by address, register by register, I'm pushing all of the registers that were in use by the process onto my stack. Okay? This is how I save it. If you look at the exception return code, what do you think happens? It just pop. Exact opposite, right? I pop them off my stack, right? So this is this instruction is swap word, which takes uh, an address. It takes a register, which is that's a TT9 as a register on MIPS, and then this is an offset from the stack pointer, right? So this stores this at offset 136 on the stack, right? And then 132, 128. This is MIPS instructions are four four, four bytes wide. So, and then this is, so th this is putting this on your stack. Once it gets to the C code, what you see is what's called a trap frame, right? So the trap frame is a uh, C data structure that holds all these registers. And again, this goes on for, for longer, right? But these are the saved registers that the exception handling code put there, right? So by the time you get to C code, you actually get a pointer to one of these structures, and you can access that structure like it's any other C code. And for some of the code you're writing in assignment two, you will have to make some selective changes to the track frame, right? Because system calls, the semantics of system calls is that they return their arguments through register, right? So when I make a system call and it returns, the process expects that there are some of the values that are returned by the system call are past the register. So you actually put them on the track frame, and then the exception return code will do the work of making sure that they're in the registers when the thread starts. Any questions about this code? Right. When does the return happen? Like, for example, first you said that the kernel will save the mode, right? So, like, can you give an example where it will return the, or pop the whole thing back? So, if, if you look here, so what actually happens is this, uh, I believe, this code does this work in assembly, right? Okay. And then it calls the C function, right? It jumps into a C function. That function executes. When that function returns, it continues running. So the parallel code to this is just below this in this file. So you can go look at it, right? And essentially, again, it reloads all the registers. And then there's a special MIPS instruction called return from exception that lowers the privilege level and jumps, you know, jumps back into the user code. Right? And again, this is all here, right? So if you guys want to see how this works, if you're confused about something that we've talked about in class, everything that we've talked about is all here. Right? So sometimes, and again, I mean, the assembly code can be a little daunting, but it is really well covered. Really, if you look at assembly code in other operating systems, you would never have, probably the longest time it might be two or three operating systems. Right? So this is really, really well documented because the idea is that people who are looking at this aren't expected to know this stuff. <coughs> All right, so let's see, do I have time for this? No, I don't. Okay, we'll do this next time. Um, and next time, so next time we'll finish up the last two slides from this today. We're going to talk about thread state, state transitions, and a little bit about threading libraries and how they work. Right? Probably next time we'll probably go a little slower and maybe do a lot more. I'll see you. On